So, um, I think today is going to be a bit shorter than, than, than yesterday, but that's probably good if there's another class coming in at 7 and we can maybe have a chance to talk a bit. So, I hope you can start to see there's something pretty odd going on here. Um, there's sort of two stringy theories, or I call them theories or pictures on the table, which differ considerably, it seems, in the size they um, attribute to space, and yet we've discussed the existence of a symmetry, and I've tried to explain the nature of that, that symmetry, um, and if there's a symmetry, then they sh they're indistinguishable. But um, how can, can that be? Um, in particular, you know, as we discussed, that they differ in R is much bigger than the Planck length, and 1 over R is much smaller than the Planck length. And it's immediately apparent that the universe is much bigger than the Planck length. I mean, this room is only a small part of the universe, and it's much bigger than the Planck plane. So something funny is going on here. So either we've made there's not really a symmetry here, or it actually has to be the case somehow that even this theory will make it appear as if the universe is very big, much bigger than the Planck plane, even if, well, the <coughs> Let's say for now, if it isn't, we're going to have to be a little careful about how we want to talk here and make some distinctions about what's going on. So, to address this, I'm going to quote, a, the, there's a sort of text for the rest of the, uh, uh, the lecture, this lecture, um, from a paper that appeared in Nuclear Physics, so it's a physics journal, by two important string theorists, or one important string theorist, Cameron Baffer, and one important cosmologist, uh, Robert Brandenburger, where they, I think, almost completely accurately uh, describe the philosophical situation. Um, it would be nice to have this paper in the talk I gave on Monday and just <laughs> show a piece of philosophy uh, in a physics journal, because I think that's exactly what you're about to see. Okay. So, from them, carefully, so we'll read and then sort of talk about, uh, break it down what we've, um, uh, yeah, the, the things that they say and work it out. By the way, uh, th this also gets discussed, so in the paper that I mentioned earlier, Ed, Ed Whitten talks about, it basically talks about this, um, Brian Green in Elegant Universe also has, uh, uh, oh, I think it's actually in a footnote, but it's like a four or five page long footnote of the, of the book describing what's going on here. Very similar terms to what I've said here as, as well, a little less mathematical detail. Okay, this symmetry, T-duality, is not just a symmetry of the spectrum, the energy spectrum, rather it is the symmetry of the whole string theory. This means that any physical process computed for the strings in a box of size R I mean, box just means S1, so it, it's a closed dimension, is identical to a dual physical process computed for the strings in a box of size 1 over R. This is done by showing that not only the spectrum is invariant, but also all the scattering amplitudes for dual processes are equal. Okay, so that's really what we've seen so far. I've got my picture up there, and they're just uh, saying, indeed, this, this is a full symmetry of the theory. Um, I didn't prove that fully, but when you look at what's going on in the symmetry, the swapping of the um, spaces and the corresponding swapping of the wave functions, it's not surprising that that's the case. One is at first sight tempted to disbelieve this duality, of course. How is it possible that we cannot distinguish the small from the large? After all, the notion of size seems to be an invariant concept in general relativity. We can measure the size of the box by measuring the time it takes to send a light ray from one side to the other. <coughs> How could this possibly fail? Right. So, you know, as, as I said, how can this really be a duality? Don't I just look around and see that the universe, I mean, I can make a very direct measurement that seems to be telling me that the universe is really big and that seems to be um, game over. And of course, what they're suggesting here is it's not, that's not a very physical sense statement that I just made. 
um, to sort of to understand more carefully what's actually going on in this case, what we need is some nice, physically clear, sort of simple model of a measurement of the size of the universe, so we can actually try and analyze what each of, how each of the jewels describes what's going on. That's the route that they take to understanding how the world can actually appear to be very large. And here's a very simple thing that you can think of that they are going to analyze. And I brought my, proj my projector, so, well, I'll sign it out the door. Um, we imagine, I don't know, the, the, suppose this room was topologically closed, so that wall is actually identical with that wall. Well, send a photon, it leaves my, th my uh, pointer, and I press the, uh, the button, travels there, comes back here, takes some finite time. Knowing the speed of light, I now know how big the room is if it wraps around. The dimension seems to be measurable. And I'll give you my little animation of it as well. Um, obviously, if the universe is small, the photon it goes around very quickly. If you weren't looking at the right place, you maybe even missed it going around. It went around so quickly. But if the universe is large, it takes a lot longer to go around. Okay? There's just going to be a difference in the time that photon takes to go around, depending on the size of the universe. Um, at some point, it took me several hours to make that animation, so I'll show it to you again. <laughs> okay, just to make the point. Um, okay, so what's, you know, how could this experiment possibly fail to reveal which of the duels we have? Um, and indeed, of course, we know what the result of the experiment's going to be. It's going to take the long time and not the very short time. Okay. So, again, all of this is quoting from their, their paper. Um, the first thing to remember, before we go on to the quotation, is we only have a sort of small amount of energy to create a photon. You know, there's a little battery in here that will make the light. Um, there's a relatively, in, you know, compared to, yeah, a relative, if you think about the whole spectrum of, strength energy spectrum of this theory, the energies we're talking about are at the lower end and not massively far up. I mean, the end, there's, there's no upper limit to the energy, but the processes we're going to be looking at are going to be around the lowest excited states of the theory. Okay, so I don't give you unlimited amounts of energy to create a photon, I just give you the pointer, you know, sort of an experimentally accessible amount of energy, the kind of energies that you deal with and that we experience in the universe as humans. So, okay. Suppose, in the first place, that the radius um, is large. Okay. Um, then it's going to be very hard to wind a, a string around it. If it's very large, it's going to take an enormous amount of energy to pull the string long enough to wrap around, in fact, even once. Twice it'll be even more energy. So if I only have a small amount of energy, what can I do? I can create a, a wave function, uh, sorry, a string whose, wave, um, whose wavelength is really long. It's nice and big, I can fit really long, the universe is big, I can fit long wavelengths in it. I can have a, what I can do with that little bit of energy is to create a photon with a long wavelength. Okay. When I talk about creating a photon, I mean I'm thinking about that in the stringy sense. But in our model, that's going to be, the state that I create is going to have you know, p equal to the, a wave number one or two or something like that. That's nice and, e nice and cheap to create. And so, for a big space, I'm gonna, not going to have any winding. Winding's going to be zero, there's going to be no winding, and I'm just going to have all my energy and momentum. Maybe I'll read that quotation at this point. So the problem is that the thought experiment fails to take into account the quantum nature of light, as well as the stringy nature of the winding modes. For a large-sized box, we can ignore these subtleties and deal with light classically, I guess the way I just said. But what about in the other case? If the size of the box gets smaller and smaller, 
the Fourier modes of the light waves get heavier and heavier, they go like one over half, it becomes energetically more and more difficult to prepare a localized light signal to send from one side to another. On the other hand, the energy of the winding strings decreases, proportional to R, and it becomes easier and easier to create winding modes. It becomes easier to construct light signals using the superposition of winding modes. Okay, so the point there is, in the small radius situation, in this second theory, like here, the shortest wavelength that I can possibly have is much smaller than the Planck length, which is a huge amount of energy. So if I only have a small amount of energy available, there's not going to be any momentum created here at all. On the other hand, this is really small, the string's really small, it can wrap around multiple times without being stretched that much. It's smaller than the Planck length. So any creation, <coughs> using that small amount of energy when I turn on the pointer and create, create the photon, is all going to be in the winding states. Okay, so first we think about the, create, you know, the nature of the photon that's created and what must necessarily be the, the, the different descriptions in the two theories. Now, because of the symmetry, from our point of view, that looks like the same photon in either case. It's just described by a certain amount of energy. But from the duality point of, from the, the two duals, the two theories, these two duals, um, there's a different description about what the state actually is. Of course, and it's not surprising because what they basically do is interchange wave functions. This wave function goes to here, and this wave function goes to here. So, um, In the first case, I said this is a wave function with winding number zero, you know, that corresponds to winding number zero. So it's going to correspond to momentum zero over here. This is a wave function that corresponds to a, um, a, a small wave number here. It's going to correspond to a small winding number over here. It's exactly the picture that we sort of have here. Um, I, let this, I mean, the language they put in here, of course, is about localized light signals. What I was talking about was thinking as if there was a momentum eigenstate or a winding eigenstate. To put in those two pictures together, of course, to do this experiment, we need the photon to be kind of localized somewhat in space. If it was actually a plane wave spread out across the whole of the universe, it doesn't do us any good for measuring time. It has to be here and then move around and come back. So the states we're creating aren't, in fact, you know, momentum eigenstates or winding eigenstates. In the momentum case, we want something localized, so it's some kind of superposition of the momentum eigenstates that makes it have a localized wave function. But all the momentum eigenstate, it, all the momentum states in that superposition are going to be lower energy kind of ones. So the same point goes through, even though it's a superposition. Correspondingly, and now this is whether you start to do different kind of thinking. Um, where all the action is in this case, of course, is in this space. Um, this wave function here is basically zero because I can't excite anything in momentum. I'm going to have a corresponding superposition of winding, um, of, uh, winding eigenstates, and they are going to Right, the, winding, uh, moment, the winding eigenstates are plane waves that are spread out all around here. When I transfer the wave function from space to winding space in the under the duality transformation, the localized wave packet that's a superposition of momentum eigenstates in this space, in this dual, will be a localized um, superposition of winding eigenstates that live at some point of this space. And dynamically, thinking about it quantum mechanically, I have a localized state that over time moves around until it comes back to the beginning, moving around this space. The story in this picture is I start off with the same um, localized wave function, wave function of the same localized form, 
and it is going to stay localized and move around this second winding space that appeared when we wanted to make um, string theory. We wanted winding to be a dynamical quantity. <coughs> and now I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of, of myself, perhaps. Um, OK, well, that's OK. Each of, these each of these theories is going to treat the photon as something localized in the larger of the two spaces, because that's where we can, you know, the small amount of energy available will allow there to be a, lo a localized p particle created. Okay. Of course, again, the jewels disagree about which of these two spaces um, the, the photon is uh, located. Okay, so, okay, good, on to the next one. Right, keep my picture. Maybe this, uh, this is the bit, I guess, where I just, that we were just, I was just talking about. How can such superposition be localized in space as the winding modes are highly non-local? in the sense that they describe how strings are wrapped around um, the whole of the space that they live in. That, that's a property of going all the way around that dimension, not at any one point of that dimension. And of course the answer is we, should be, we need to think that the concept of localization is not that classical one, but has to be thought of in terms of the wave function that lives in the winding space. The point is that the notion of position is a derived concept in ordinary quantum field theory, we define the position to be the Fourier transform of momentum states. Um, so really, I'm going to say the same thing. So this is the ordinary case. The basis I start with is, is plane waves around it, energy eigenstates. And if I want to think about what a localized particle is, I take a suitable superposition so that the wave function ends up um, peaked at some particular point and not spread around the whole of the space. Their point is, the same trick applies in the winding space. The eigenstates are, um, those are <coughs> definite winding, but if you take a superposition of them, they're plane waves, I can build a Fourier trans you know, have a Fourier series to build up a nice um, particle that's localized in this space. And that's the sense, right? The notion of position in that case, in that sense, is a derived concept coming from the momentum eigenstates. Um, this, this italicizing and underlining is, is my addition to their, their paper, by the way. So in ordinary quantum field theory, we define the position to be the Fourier transform of momentum states. In the string theory under consideration, we have, in addition, the option of choosing the Fourier transform of the winding modes to define a new position as the Fourier transform of the winding. Okay. So Witten talked about this second space as a new direction or a new dimension in space. And because of the, you know, the full um, parallelism between the, the states in the, different, in, the two, in the two spaces, one can equally define and think of position in that second space. In one definition of position, the radius is r, and in the other, the radius is 1 over r. There's no physical principle which tells us which definition of position is more fundamental, and therefore they are equally valid. So I'll show you this again. We now see what's going on. Okay? In the first theory, um, this space that the string lives in, um, this experiment is described by a particle localized in this space and moving around it. And we're timing its motion around here, so we get um, R. <coughs> in the second theory, because this is where we excited things, the, the particle, the photon, is localized, corresponds to a state localized in here and its motion around space, its apparent motion around um, space, corresponds to a mo the, the parallel symmetric motion around that space. So, okay, at this point, we've sort of seen, it, it, whether, if we buy into the symmetry, and actually at the end we'll come back and talk about whether we really should, so how we should understand the symmetry, whether we should really take it seriously, um, the picture we really have is, when we went into this, and you know, I kind of encouraged this, 
we just I, we only had theory one to start with, and we were thinking of this compact radius as being that as we you know of the radius of a dimension that we experience as as being space, one of the dimensions of this room, or one of the dimensions that's relevant in quantum field theory or in general relativity, and we just unproblematically thought that's the space we would, this is the space we're talking about. But what we've seen is, in, if, in, because of this duality, um, that's not an unproblematic assumption. We equally well, before we start actually kind of going about measuring things, even in the first theory, perhaps it's the winding space that we should have thought of as being the one that we observe and the one we ordinarily refer to as space. Well, we could do the experiment and see that this couldn't be, you know, it, it, that couldn't be right in this case, but we see that it could be right in this case. In other words, we just have to be a little more careful here talking about space. In other words, to start with, we just thought that the string, the space was living in, that the string was living in space, and that's just the space we're ordinarily referring to. And then we introduced a second space, a winding space. Can't really see it. it. Says W space here for winding space. This is not quite the way they put it, but I think the way to think about it more clearly is you need to distinguish three spaces. So first of all, there's ordinary space, or just space for short. That's what we thought space was before we knew about string theory. It's just the space we move around in. It's the space that you write down when you do general relativity or quantum field theory or Newtonian mechanics or whatever. That, that thing, that's the space we refer to. And, however, from the string theory point of view, there's two other spaces that we should distinguish. Um, I've written it up here as T space because. Okay, the technical term is target space, T is for target. It's as it were the space into which the string is mapped by this x mu function. Okay. The space with the x mu coordinates is the target for the world sheet. And then the other one which we sort of introduced earlier, winding space. So there are just two spaces in this discussion, but really three. And what's going on here is, according to the first dual, um, ordinary space is, or the appearance of ordinary space is explained by, depending on how you want to put it, target space. But in this dual, the appearance of ordinary space, and by the way, of course, ordinary space is the one we're saying is obviously large, is explained by um, processes occurring in winding space. That's how one can still can understand why this experiment fails. Whatever process, whatever experiment you do in one system, and I suppose it, always, it leads to a large number, is corresponding to some process in this description. But there's going to be, because of the symmetry, an, an, an exactly parallel symmetric process in here in the winding space in the other dual, and all we can do, right, it's like, again, like the harmonic oscillator if you can't take it apart, all you can do is look at the values of observables, and they're exactly under this symmetry going to be the same. And we've seen that in the case of this specific process. So, all right, I've kind of indicated that now. In theory one, ordinary, the appearance of ordinary space is explained by T-space. In theory two, the appearance of ordinary space is explained um, by winding space. So, and, yeah, okay. Before I go on to the quotation, let me just add uh, a comment.
as I said, I mean, we always have, in the scales that are relevant here, we always have only access to um, low energies, right? We're never going to have access to energy, to, to the amount of energy to produce a wave, from, to produce a, wave a, a particle with momentum such that its um, wavelength is much smaller than the Planck length. That's just a ridiculous amount of energy. So the processes we're actually able to um, observe and control here are going to be ones um, you know, that we're capable of measuring sort of directly are going to be ones with low energy, and so they're going to be excitations in the large radius space-time. Um, let me back up. I mean, <coughs> if string theory is properly testable, the effects of winding should be observable as well. What I mean is experiments that are kind of direct experiments where you're trying to measure the radius of space by something along the lines of the photon measurement. That's going to be an excitation in the, in the large radius space. Okay. It's, it's not that the winding is sort of irrelevant, but if you actually do something that you would classically think of as a measurement of the radius or di diameter of space, uh, circumference of space, you're going to be using low energies and you're going to, you're going to be looking, seeing processes in either here or here, and so it's going to turn out to be large. So, their conclusion, and maybe they don't get everything quite right. So it's interesting to note in connection with this that there is no physical experiment which tells us whether today we live in a universe of size 10 to the 62 Planck lengths. They're taking the string length to be equal to the Planck length in this paper. Um, so 10 to the 10 light years are in a tiny universe of size 10 to the minus, six, minus 62 Planck units. Of course, the more useful definition of position uses the Fourier transforms relative to the light states. With this definition of position, we see that the effective minimum size of the box is R equals 1, the Planck length, which is the point yeah. we made earlier. So that's actually sort of the opposite. So I think... There's a sense in what they say is quite right. Um, it's not, of course, it's the opposite of what I said, and it seems like a rather strange thing to say, because again, we know what this photon experiment would reveal, and we can see very easily that the universe is in fact much bigger than the Planck, Planck, Planck length. But my terminology over here helps clarify what it is that they're, they're saying. What's perfectly clear is that ordinary, there's no problem forming an experiment to tell that ordinary space is much bigger than the Planck scale. What they're saying is there's no experiment that will tell us what size target space is. And of course that's exactly a co consequence of this symmetry. The whole point is both jewels are exactly predictably the same under the symmetry but they have radically different statements about how big target space is. Target space being then the space that strings, in whatever sense, would literally be wrapped around. Okay, the, these two jewels are indistinguishable, so there is no way, no experiment to tell which is the two jewels, so, i.e. no experiment to say what size target space is. But the natch, you know, to talk, one needs, therefore, to be very careful talking about you know, space and how big the universe is. When they're talking about the universe, they're talking about target space. This would be a very strange thing to say if we were talking about phenomenal, observable space, the space of appearances, which clearly is, has the appearance of being large. Okay. Before closing this section, let us emphasize one important lesson that we have learned. The invariant notions of general relativity, such as distance, may not be invariant notions for string theory on um, short distance scales. So this comes back to the point that I had, this is also my italicizing, to the same point, that because of this duality, they're saying, um, the notion of distance the distance between my hands, the idea of proper length of any object. Proper length is a, is a relativistic invariant notion. Um, say, this is not an, a, an invariant at the level of string theory. 
in the sense, again, talking about target space. There, the two jewels, pick any object that's some fraction of the, whose length is some fraction of the radius, the two jewels assign different lengths to it because they assign um, different uh, values to the radius. You can think of these something along the lines of um, different, inert, so different inertial frames in special relativity have different standards of simultaneity. In a similar way, these two jewels, um, and the last slide will talk about how to draw out that analogy. All right, so simultaneity is not an invariant of the theory, it's frame dependent. Well, length is not an invariant of this theory either. It's um, dual dependent, how big things are in the target space sense. Again, in the apparent sense, if we operationalize a measurement, the two jewels are going to tell you that the thing is an object, a classical object that we look at is going to be the same length. But they're going to have different stories about it. And from the target space point of view, length is not the same in the two, um, in the two theories. Okay. So it's not an invariant notion. And well, the thought that you start to have that, that you should start to have thing then is that frame dependent quantities aren't really the real ones. They're just perspectives on what the real quant what the real underlying structure is in some sense. Okay, uh, there's the citation just to prove that it's really physicists writing in a physics journal that uh, are talking about this kind of analysis. Um, actually, the paper is a rather interesting one. They, they, they um, super strings in the early universe. They try to come up with an argument for why there are three large dimensions that are sort of uncurled. Um, still, um, S1 circular dimensions, and the idea is in the early universe, there were all 26 dimensions or 10 <coughs> dimensions, um, and strings wrap around them, holding them really small. But there's a way in which it, the dimensionality affects how the likelihood, the, the possibility of strings colliding. You know, if you have a pair of point particles in a plane, then unless they're moving in parallel or opposite directions, they're going to collide eventually. But if they move in three dimensions, it's basically a measure zero set of point of cases where they're going to actually intersect. An argument along those lines that with strings, you'll get all the strings will, um, you can keep having strings annihilating each other and dimensions expanding until you've got three dimensions and then the strings won't ever hit each other. So that keeps all the other ones small. Sorry, that, that's a real kind of sidetrack, but the purpose of the paper right, is this idea that in the early universe there was some kind of plasma of strings that kept all but three of the people that kept all but three of the dimensions small. And so there's a kind of string theoretic explanation of the, large, the number of large dimensions we see. Okay. Um, So, yeah, I'm going to finish with um, three possible, to sort of back off and do three possible interpretations of um, T-duality. Um, the second one of which is the one I think that best describes what Brandenburger and Baffer's um, attitude is. All right, I've got my picture of the two duels again, so I think we understand those at, at this point. Well, one attitude you might take is these are two really different situations. Target space could be big, radius r, it could be small, 1 over r, and those are not the same thing. Um, but because of the symmetry, the argument they've just given, we just have no way of telling which one is, whether it's big or small, which one of those is the um, appropriate, uh, is the correct description. Okay, and you know, how do we understand that these are different? Well, I think put some weight on the idea of winding. The strings are quantum, so the, it's not really right to think of them as classically winding around, but there's some kind of sense of quantum winding, and the difference um, between uh, T space and W space is the strings wind around one and they don't wind around the other. That's where the, uh, this winding wave function lives. Um, but again, we just can't tell which one because of this, um, this symmetry. I'm going to accept the symmetry is given as, as, as the right point. 
Um, this is an argument recently, um, this position recently defended by um, a philosopher, uh, Jeremy Butterfield, philosopher of physics um, at Cambridge. And I'm going to draw a sort of analogy to special relativity to try, I, I hope that's more familiar so people can think that, so see what's going on in these examples. So that's a bit like taking the Lorentzian attitude to the sort of null results in michelson morley experiments. Okay? That there's, in fact, there's an absolute simultaneity and a fact about the speed of light. But matter shrinks and expands and clocks speed up and slow down, literally, with respect to the preferred frame in a way that conspires to stop you from telling which is the preferred frame. This is the kind of Lorentzian um, view of special relativity. There is a fact of the matter, but nature conspires to stop us seeing it. Okay. Just take the contraction and dilation as literal, um, absolute facts. Second one, yeah, there really is a difference between, you know, there are two spaces, and there really is a sense in which strings are wound around one, and they're not wound around the other. It's sort of in the nature of strings that they have different relations to those two spaces, one of which we think of as being wound around one and not wound around the other, in that some quantum extension of the classical sets. But we don't think about the duals as being two different possibilities. Somehow they are like different inertial frames, you know, just different perspectives on one possibility. They really have to be taken as being fully physically equivalent. Um, they're just descriptively different somehow or other. But it's rather extreme in this case. Um, when you first learn that the simultaneity is relative, that's a pretty extreme thing to, you know, to, to, to think through. So maybe it's no more extreme than that once you're used to it. But there's a difference between you know, there's a fact about which space is target space and which space is winding space, but there's no fact, it's not determinate whether the, the radius of target space is R or whether it's 1 over R, whether it's big or small. Again, like simultaneity or you know, other kinds of non-invariant quantities, it's, as it were, frame-dependent, dual-dependent. Those quantities aren't fundamentally real um, quantities, they're just perspectives on what is actually real. And that seems to be the attitude they have here. Um, it's now a matter of the target space. It's physically equivalent to say that its radius is R, or that its radius is 1 over R. Those aren't physically different in any way. They're just somehow differences, choices of frame. I can't pick observers in the same way to attach to frames that I can as you do in special relativity. Um, but forget about the observers and just think about the different frames. They seem to say different things, but they're not physical differences. They're just frame-dependent differences. And the same sort of attitude is sort of needed here. Um, and so that's kind of the, the sort of Einstein attitude. Um, okay, we, we apply the principle of relativity and we think of those frames. That tells us those frames just have to be equivalent descriptions. That's what relativity means. And there's a similar kind of relativity here. These just have to be the same, physically the same. But if they're physically the same, there is no physical difference between target space having a radius r and having a radius 1 over r. And then I will note that it's definitely the case that target space is not ordinary space because the radius of ordinary space is perfectly determinate. We've seen a measurement to described a measurement that would tell us what the radius was. And so, on this view, the space in which the strings live with an unwind, target space around this, is not the space we live in. And we have this story about how the appearance of um, how space appears. And I guess in the first alternative, um, the space, ordinary space, may be target space, or it may be um, winding space. We don't know which one. In the second case, it's definitely not target space, and similarly, definitely not winding space. Okay, and then the third sort of attitude, um, I couldn't think of a better name to sort of call it, sort of, sort of unstrings, that 
we're kind of misled somehow by the still, really by trying to keep up any vestige of the classical picture of strings here. That's sort of leading us astray. Um, but our mistake is, you know, and the two pictures are different in what target space is like and what winding space is like. But maybe there really isn't any difference. I mean, there's just two spaces and there's no physical significance to calling one of them target space and one of them winding space. That's where the... Um, that, that just has... that distinction has no physical significance. So you can look at the picture and sort of see the point. If I kind of crossed out T space here and W space here, I haven't made any different change at all in this duality. In the first dual, I have a big space with a wave function psi living on it, and a small space with a wave function um, phi living on it. In the theory two, I have a big space also with psi living on it, and a small space with um, phi living on it. And then all I've done is change the variable of the labels the points of the space. And so these two duals no longer are any different at all. There's just a big, a big space and a small space and a wave function in each. And, the, okay. and maybe that's something like um, the Minkowski picture. We don't really need relativity in uh, the Minkowski picture. We just have the underlying basic geometry and no frames at all. We just have a Minkowski metric. Um, we have the causal structure and the metrical structure that um, goes with it. And, of course, we can go back to the Einstein picture and write, see how to construct frames in that Minkowski space-time, but it's very clear what the, I mean, the Minkowski geometry just has the invariant objects. It isn't frame-dependent um, at all. So, uh, okay. And we, then, but then we can say, look, there's a the big space and the small space, and for the reasons, because we only have low energy, we're going to excite lower energy states. They're always going to be living in the large radius space. And we can say, well, the large radius space is space, or gives a rise to the, you know, explains the appearance of space, if you like. Um, but what we lose, as I said, is any distinct, any sense in which winding of there's a difference between winding and momentum for strings because there's just big wave function in big, big space, wave function in small space, and no sense in which one of them is describing the winding or one of them is describing the momentum because exactly what we're saying is there's no, such, there's no distinction between T space and winding space, no distinction between the space which is relevant to momentum and the space that's relevant to winding. That's what we're giving up in this interpretation. And in that case, the strings are just completely, you know, really not the same as the classical picture you started with at all. They're not little spatial things kind of at all. That's just a kind of nice classical limit way of thinking about them. But there's no such thing as their momentum or that versus their winding. There's just these kind of two degrees of freedom and how they appear to us when we do a measurement in ordinary space. So, the first one, there's just a kind of epistemic problem about um, one of these spaces is ordinary space or appears as ordinary space. Um, there's nothing too weird happening in that case. <coughs> the second case, um, although we started by um, you know, putting the string into target space and discussing it that way, we just discovered that is not actually the, directly the space we're talking about at all. Strings live in some, some other kind of weirder space which doesn't have a particular radius. It's indifferent between these two. This case, well, strings do live in, do live in a space, but they're really not kind of strings in the way we were thinking about at all. They're not particularly kind of spatial objects like that at all. So, the upshot is there's very di some different op you know, options you have here. A number of them put um, sort of pressure on the idea that string theory is just simply a theory of strings living in space. That's not really compatible with... Well, it's compatible with one, but that's not the only way to go in string theory, given T-duality. And... Let's see, I think. 
Well, then I have the other two points that I neglected to fill in at this point, but I will remind me to tell you that T-duality is just the simplest of the dualities that exist in um, string theory. Others are perhaps even more disturbing that they relate um, target spaces of different, of different topologies, so you can't even tell what the shape of the space is, properly speaking. Um, dualities are also important in the string theory concept of um, M-theory, there are different, when you go to the fermionic strings that I talked about and superstring theory, you find that there are different um, versions of these theories, but it also turns out that they're linked by different dualities. Um, so that, you know, uh, states, uh, certain states in one <coughs> formulation, one of one formulation of string theory, in fact, turn out to be not different from um, states in another formulation, but dual to them. So this let the, the symmetries between the different, and there's, there are um, dualities that will take you from any one formulation of string theory to any other. And string theorists got very excited about this uh, in the, the 1990s, especially as an indication that there was some kind of underlying theory and what the different, would look like different versions of string theory or in fact just different kind of limits of that or different sectors of that theory and you could see that they were underlying under, uh, um, the underlying structure was some common theory that they were just different formulations of um, but no one figured out what M theory was to this point so it's a, that was a good, you know, a good idea but still a work in progress Okay, well, we have like 10 minutes for questions. I think that's all I kind of have to say for today. I'm happy to, yeah, take your questions. Um, well, I'm kind of lost, of course, but if I measure in the big universe the photon going around the universe with low energy, that's equivalent to me to be in the small universe doing what, rewinding? Winding along wavelengths uh, for a long time around the universe until it winds up, so the time yeah. is the same. So, you know, in, when you're saying it in the big and small, you're thinking in the target space sense. Mm. Okay. Either way, you're in the, it's big in the ordinary space sense. But that's right. So, in the, if target space is large, the story you tell about the measurement you, you did um, refers to a state evolving in target space, and if target space is small, you're talking about a dual process that occurs in the dual winding space, which in the dual is big because target space is small. Like the time I measure is the same in both? Yes, yes. And in the first it's a photon, but what, what, what's the process in the second case? That takes a long time. Is it winding the string? Is that it? So in both, so photon is something okay, good. So photon is something that refers to ordinary space. So either way, it's a photon, either, right? I mean, that's what the symmetry says. If I create, you know, I have a story about in which I create a photon in target space in one dual and do something to it. The symmetry means so I'm taking photon and you know, to be an observer, you know, to, to have sort of a, um, observational empirical significance. In the other dual that object that I'm referring to will correspond to yeah, a parallel process in winding space. So, for me, either way, it's the same. I, fly, I, turn, the, I, I, I turn the light on, emit the photon, start the clock, wait till it comes around. Both duels, that's what happens phenomenologically. That's the experiment that we experience. But, so, Again, just to emphasize that, but you're right. So, in top, but in target space, the story, the quantum story of what we what just happened involves something localized in target space moving around. In the other, in the dual, it corresponds to right a process um, localized in winding space and moving around. Um, and now maybe I'm getting to the actual sort of nub of the question. It's a localized particle in winding space. So it's a superposition of plane waves that live in winding space. So it's some kind of superposition of states of winding of different number. So it's not a particular number of winding, it's some other kind of, it's quantum mechanics, so there's not just classical kind of winding around. <coughs>
Can I think of a temporal measurement in both of these? Yes, okay, so this duality is just referring to the spatial part of the story. So time is not affected by this. So time kind of plays this exactly the same role. Because in the first case, you use time to measure the size of the universe. There's only one case. Okay, the dual, uh, doesn't the process happen in which you will extract a time, a certain time, and interpret that as, is it not, would it be the same time that you would obtain in the target space? So, I mean, in this thought experiment, I'm just giving myself access to something, some kind of Einsteinian clock, so I can, I can just measure time. But time is ticking off the same way in both duels. So the focus is on the, the position part, and what appears to what we observe as a, a position, um, kind of a, you know, a process in, or in ordinary space, the two duels disagree about whether that's a process at the more fundamental level in target space or in winding space. But whatever rate it occurs, you know, whatever rate it um, proceeds in target space in one duel, it will proceed at exactly the same rate in winding space in the other duel. Yeah. yeah. I have a question on the second interpretation. Is the target space <clears throat> are not the same as the ordinary space? Then why should one expect that the extension of gravity light extension of the strings that leave in the target space will generate the geometry of ordinary space? Um, what do you mean by that? I, I was with you till the very last part. What? Do, why would do you mean? Why would these things appear as photons? Or did you mean no, why no, would no. they? I have the strings and the extension of the strings. Yeah. I mean the and case. The gravity light extension of the strings. I think that this is related with the geometry of the space because of general relativity. So, if I describe the gravity, I will describe some geometry. But the strings live in the target space. So, I, I could expect that the, these excitations that seem like gravity of That's the correct. strings yeah. describe the geometry of ordinary space. So, really answering that question is going to, I think, relies on some things we'll talk about tomorrow. Oh. The geometry of the space, though, I mean, I just put in Minkowski, a Minkowski background here. But you're thinking there's going to be curved space, that that's going to be curvature because I have a photon and now there's stress energy and good, good. But, the, what, but what goes for the, for the photons in this case will also go for gravitons. So the low energy gravitons, for the very same reasons, in this jewel will live, in the first jewel will live in target space, in the second jewel will live in. Um, winding space, and so they're going to enter. I mean, the curvature at the quantum level is going to be a story about the um, interaction of the photon with the gravitons, and the gravitons are going to be ex for the same reason. Their low energy are going to be excitations in the same space as the photon. But the photon and the graviton are excitations of the strings. Right. Yeah. And these excitations are in the target space. No. In the first jewel, they're in the target space. In the second jewel, they're in the, in the winding space. In the ordinary space. In you both see the no, in ordinary space, and you see the gravity in the ordinary space. In both cases, they're going to be in ordinary space. But in one jewel, so the, in both cases, in both spaces, in both the duels, they're going to appear as if they're in um, ordinary space. In the first duel, they're in fact, at the fundamental level, going to be in target space. In the second one, in the second duel, they're going to be in winding space. In the first duel, the appearance of a large ordinary space is explained by processes in target space. In the second duel, the appearance of large ordinary space is explained by processes in winding space. Just exactly symmetric processes, okay? So in one case, photons and gravitons in, uh, up in, the, in the target space, and in this one, they'll be living in winding space. Good, good. Anyone else? I think that's pretty good. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Obrigada, gente.